Wednesday night virtual Bible study class. I'm Pastor Gary Mack. I'll be your instructor tonight. Truly is a blessing and honor to be here tonight. We give God the praise for what he's going to do tonight. I'm so glad to have you. Uh, join us, please join us on SBC Praise Church on Facebook. And also join us on, excuse me, on, uh, not Facebook, but uh, YouTube channel. And on Facebook, join us. Call a friend, call a family member, call them up and welcome them to our Bible study class. We're going to have an exciting time tonight. I'm glad to be with you. The Lord has given me a word just for you. And what I want to do tonight before I get started, I want to open in a word of prayer. Because I do believe in the power of prayer. And if you would join in with me, let us go before the throne of grace. Eternal God, our Father, our Lord and Savior. Lord, we thank you for this marvelous day that you have made. Lord, you have brought us through the day. And Lord, you have kept us. You have protected us. And for that, we say thank you. Lord, if somebody is listening on the airways tonight, Lord, I need a word from you. And Lord, I pray that they will get exactly what they are searching for. Lord, whether they're hurting, whether they're in pain, whether they know somebody who's lacking, Lord, we intercede for those that can't pray for themselves, Lord. So right now, have your way. Lord, let us break bread together. Let us learn what you have for us tonight. And Lord, we will give you all the praise, honor, and glory that's due unto your name. Once again, I'm Pastor Gary Mack here at Shallow Baptist Church, one family in two locations where our senior pastor is the Dr. Reverend James Allen Duncan. So I thank him for the opportunity. And we're going to get right into the word tonight. What the Lord has given me to give you you. Uh, you see right behind me the title on the screen. It says, Finding Your Peace in the Middle of Chaos. How, how many can relate to that? Finding your peace. Because what the enemy has done, the enemy has sought to take your peace. And some of us, I hate to admit it, some of us have given up our peace. In the middle of chaos. I want my peace back. I want my joy back. I want those things that make me feel good when I'm serving the Lord and I'm with my family. I'm working. I'm doing the best I can. I need some peace. I don't know about y'all, but I've been searching for it. And I found the keys to getting my peace back in the middle of chaos. Can you give the Lord a praise? My foundation scripture will be Philippians 4, that be 4 and 7. 4 and 7. That's our foundational scripture. Chaos. What does chaos mean? Chaos means complete disorder and confusion. Can you relate to that? Complete disorder. Things are disarray. They're not going the way you plan. Train wreck. Disorder. Disarray. Disorganize. These are some of the similar words that uh, can kind of help define chaos. Confusion. Man. Talk to me tonight. Madness, havoc, turmoil, uproar. Something to get in your spirit to stop you from having that peace with God. Our everyday life, we got work, we got children, we have, you know, we have different ailments that we deal with. We have responsibilities. Some of us take care of other people. And sometimes that can disturb our peace. But I'm not talking about the world of peace. The question I have for you tonight is, do you need some peace? Do you need some peace? How many of you believers out there is sick and tired of your, the roller coaster ride of emotions concerning your peace of mind? I mean, you're sick and tired of it. You pray one minute, you believe in God one minute, everything seems to be going well, and then all of a sudden, here come that wind of problems and frustration and mayhem and it knocks us off our course. And that peace, that little peace we did have, is now gone. How many of us get sick and tired of praying and believing God and marching by faith and trusting in the name of the Lord? And then all of a sudden, it comes that storm again and knocks us right back down. I don't know about y'all, but I'm sick and tired of it and I start looking for remedies to keep me with peace the peace of God that passes all understanding. I want to hold on to it. I want to keep it around for a while. I want, I want it to be when I wake up in the morning. I want it to be when I lay down at night. I want to have that peace and comfort of God. Kids, work, your thoughts, your, your lacks and your wants. There's so many other things that can take that peace of mind from you. 
I want you to remember one thing that the devil has laid out so many devices to trip us up, to, to prevent us from having the peace of God. St. John 10.10, 10, for the enemy, the thief comes not, but to steal, kill, and destroy. We know that scripture. We can quote it with our eyes closed. But I come to tell you, there is some peace, some godly peace. And then anyway, he said, Steve come to steal, kill, and destroy. But God said he came that we might have life and that more abundantly. That's where the peace comes from. That peace comes from the abundant, but abundance of God. God will give you exactly what you need in a time of trouble. He promised us that. The enemy want to hold us captive. He wants to oppress you. He wants to defeat you. But hang in there, my sister, my brother. The peace of God is right there. All you got to do is fight for it. God already, God already laid out the plans. But sometimes God give it to you and we give it back. Because we let the weight of the world, we let our situations, we let the things that we go through in life, we let people, we let people rub us the wrong way and disturb our peace. We let those activities on the job that mess, that rumors, or the rumors that are going around, and we join in with them, and we say we wasn't. We find ourselves falling into these traps that the enemy had designed just for you. Because he knows, as a child of God, he knows he can't snatch you out of God's hand, but he can't trip you up so you can trip others up. Yeah, they're watching you, the world's watching you, the devil's watching you, and he's coming after your peace of mind. Don't give it to him. Don't give it to him. Sometimes we have to fight for our peace. You can never truly know what real peace is if you have never been under real pressure. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about I stump my toe. I'm not talking about that type of pressure. I'm talking about real pressure. Where it seems like the world and everything in it is against you. Your finances, even your own body, seem like it has turned against you. Pressure where you can't even think straight. I'm talking to the church folks tonight. And I'm hoping some unbelievers hear me as well. Because you need to be connected to the one who brings the peace. And the only one who can bring you that peace is Jesus Christ. Our Lord and Savior. God our Father. Led by the Holy Spirit that lives in us. And you have to have a personal relationship to be entitled to this godly peace that we're going to be talking about tonight. You can never truly know what real pressure is, peace is, excuse me. You can never really know what real peace is if you haven't been through anything. These are some of the things that we're going to be discussing these next few weeks. I need y'all prayer with me. This, this, I need y'all prayer right now. I need you prayer right now because the enemy want to want to tune you out. He wants you to listen to this. Uh, he wants somebody to say, I've heard this before and I'm still in the same mess. But let me tell you something. If you seek the Lord with your whole heart, you will find him. Because he never left you, nor will he say, he's right there with you. But the problem is sometimes we don't do what the word God tells us to do. We don't wait long enough. We don't tarry long enough. We want a quick fix. So these are some of the things that we're going to be talking about that lead to peace. Believe it or not, there are some things that don't go right in our life that leads us to, to our peace. And here's three things I want to cover. These are things we're going to be covering through the week. The first one is, the pressures of life. The pressures of life. The situations you go through. The heated pressure. The, the weight. The things that sometimes cause you not to sleep. It is funny that um, I thought when my kids was young, I thought that the trouble was over. I thought when they were young, once they got older, I figured once they got older, it would all go away. But seeing like I worry about them now that they've grown more than I did, when they were younger, because the pressures of life, the love and the care we have for other people. Sometimes we spend more time caring about others than we neglect ourselves sometimes. God wants you to have that peace where you can care about them. You can trust in Him that everything will be all right, even though you can't see them, even though you can't be everywhere they are. God said, I got you. I got them. Trust in me. Do what I ask you to do. Serve me. Seek me with your whole heart, and you will find me. He said, Take heed to my commandments, my instructions, my word of God, and it will lead and guide you to all truth. Trust in the Lord. These are some things that we have to continually do over and over again. So the first thing is, the pressure of life will lead, you, lead us to peace. 
Oh yeah, oh yeah. We're gonna discover that. We're gonna we're gonna unpeel that layer of onion. We're gonna find out more about that as we go along. Pains of life, pain, hurts. Pains and hurts of life will lead us to peace. Yes, it will. Poverty, lack of, not having some things, rather be money or peace of mind, will lead you into peace. Stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. Pains of life that leads us to peace. Before I get into this, I want to start by one of the pains I had. I remember in 1994, um, this is the year before I got saved, before I gave my life to the Lord. Well, he saved me. He, he, he chose me. I didn't choose him. He called me and I accepted him as Lord and Savior in 95. But in 94, I remember on my job that um, I had this serious condition, uh, kidney stone problem. And those who, if you ever had kidney stones, I, I know y'all, whoever had it can relate to it. That is some serious pain. I'm talking about excruciating pain. Pain that you don't even want to put on your worst enemy. And I had an episode. I've never had it before. And all of it came out of nowhere. In 1994, I remember being at work. And um, I had this pain in my side where it hurt so bad I was buckled over. I couldn't stand up straight. I didn't know what it was. You talk about fear. I thought I was dying. It was just that painful. I thought I was leaving here. And it, it had me bulking over where I couldn't walk. I, I remember calling my wife at the time. We were, you know, my girlfriend at the time. We weren't married at the time. But we were living together. Yeah, we were shacking. So did you. Don't, don't judge me. But the Lord brought me out of darkness to the market. It's like, I'm saved now. But anyway, I remember calling her and telling her to come get me. I was in so much pain. You know, I was afraid of needles. I was afraid of the doctor. You know how we are. We don't want to go to the doctor. But I still, I was afraid that I wasn't going to make it. It was that much pain. Stay with me here. I know where I'm going. And I called her, and she said, everything right? I said, no, I need you to get here. I might have to go to the hospital. I'm in a lot of pain. When I say I got to go to the hospital, I'm in pain. So she, I hung up the phone, and I remember walking out to the curb. Because I left my car. I was walking out to the curb so I could meet her. And I remember sitting on a hill. And I was in so much pain. I didn't even realize I passed out. And the reason why I knew I passed out. Because when she got there. She woke me up. And she said, come here. And I said, oh, you got here quick. And she said, no, I couldn't come right away. I had to delay. It took me a while before I got here. It was almost like I had passed out from the pain. You're talking about fear when I found that out. On my way to the hospital, I'm living in fear and in pain at the same time. You're talking about pain. Pain that led me to peace. Even though I wasn't saved, this pain, this fear, that trepidation of, of fear that took over me, going to the hospital, knowing, thinking that I'm going to die when I get there. You know how we do. We think the worst. And I remember getting to the hospital, and I'm afraid, but I was in so much pain. But because I was in so much pain, when it came to get that needle, she said, I'm going to have to get your needle to ease this pain. Because I was bawling over. I, I, I'm moaning and groaning. And she, I, I rolled up my sleeve like, okay, give me a needle. When you're in so much pain, you do things that you, you were afraid to do. And I rolled up my sleeve so she can give me the needle. She said, uh-uh, not there. <laughs> this guy on your backside. <laughs> I took my mind up so quick because I was in so much pain that I needed some peace. I, I, I couldn't rest. I couldn't think straight. The enemy had to think I was dying. Have you ever been there? Maybe, maybe it wasn't a kidney stone. Maybe, maybe it was a wayward child that you left home and never came back and you're looking for me. You couldn't rest. I'm talking about pain and pressure where it throws you off your game. Like I said, I wasn't saved at the time, but the Lord was Ordered my footsteps. He was bringing me into the kingdom. The next year I got saved. And I've been here ever since. But God gave me, he took me through pain to get me to the peace that I was looking for. I took the needle. I remember going, everything went well. The pain was going and I had to wind up getting surgery. I don't want to talk about the seriousness of the surgery because it was a serious surgery because the stone had traveled so far that I had to do surgery to go in and get it. Which was another painful process. But the thing is, I went through it with peace because the pain led me to that. 
Sometimes you're going through so much trials when you run through a brick up to a brick wall and you got nowhere else to go. Either you're gonna fail, give up, or turn over to the enemy, or you're gonna call on the name of the Lord. I had been in church enough to know who to call on. I was praying, trying to speak in tongues, I tried to do everything. It was so much pain that was overwhelming. I applaud you. Do something. Call on the name of the Lord. He will answer you and show you mighty Jeremiah 33 and 3 and show you mighty things you have never seen before. But call on him. Make an effort. Make a move. Pain, pain. The pains of life will lead you to peace. Pains of life. Uh, physical suffering or discomfort caused by illness or injuries. What is pain? Pain is an unpleasant signal that something hurts. It is a complex experience that differs greatly from person to person. Even between those similar injuries and, or illnesses, pain can be very mild, almost unnoticeable, or explosive. You don't know the level of pain people go through. It's still pain to them. God will lead you. The Holy Spirit will lead you through your pain to some peace. Can we get a little more praise in here? Pressure. It's pressure of life. Pressure of life that leads to peace. A continuous physical force on or against an object by something in contact with you. Uh, is pressure a feeling? You're feeling pressure when something presses on you. Sometimes it can be the weight of a situation. It's pressing on you and causing you to lose focus. I know I'm going. I got some scripture to back this up. I just want to get you set to know that you're not alone. You're not crazy. The pains and pressure of life seem like they're unbearable, but God has you exactly where he wants you. The reason why God allows the pain to come out of life to get us back in position of what he called us to do, to line up with his purpose. To line up with his plan. There's people out there that's waiting on you to tell your testimony and tell your story about the goodness of the Lord. They don't want to hear my testimony. They seen your walk. They seen like how much trouble you were in. They seen how, how high you got when you was out there getting high. They seen that. And they see a miracle in your life. You might not believe this, but your walk. They said the life that we live will speak for us. The fruit that you bear. That's why it's so important. Believe it. I hope y'all are listening to me. Believe it. Tell your story. Tell somebody where God brought you from. Tell them which trouble you've been in and you felt like giving up or you didn't know which direction to turn. But somebody prayed for you. The power of prayer. We need more prayer in the church. We need more prayer in our home. We need prayer back in the school. They don't have to pray at school, but you can talk and tell them. You can speak underneath your breath and thank God. Going down the hall is giving God praise. You know, you know God is calling us now. He's giving young people the wisdom and the knowledge to be the thinking, to be able to do social media, do all these things that we couldn't do when I was a kid. God giving gifts left and right. And those gifts are supposed to be used to glorify Him. And that will bring peace if we do what God called us to do. Pressure, pressure. Also poverty, life, lack, no finance, no place to stay, not enough money to stay. Housing is so high, so expensive now, even the rental home. These are things people are struggling with. When we're clapping and shouting in church, this is what people are going through. And we need to be able to tell them that God will make a way. Bring them, invite them to church. Tell them that God has an answer for you. Through the word of God, through the man of God, or the woman of God, whoever is delivering the word, you got to be excited about the word of God. So when they come, they can hang on to the joy. And that peace that you had. Yeah, I know all the all the stuff that's going around the world. I know about the wars over in Israel. I know about the wars right now in our backyard. The killing of black and black crime. I know all of that stuff that's going on. All that stuff. That's, those are our children. They're, they're in our community. These are the things that we worry about while we're going through our eating, while we're wrestling with cancer, while we don't have a job, or while we just got laid off. These are some of the things, some of the weight of the world, the pressure and the pains of the world that people go through, even as believers. But I tell you to hang on in there. Hang on there. God got a remedy. It's trusting in Him. It's that godly peace. That's what you're looking for. If you're looking for peace, you want godly peace. You don't want the worldly peace. I just got a good night's sleep. That's worldly peace. I'm talking about the godly peace. 
that when the storm and the flames are all around you and it seems like there's no way out, that's the godly people when you can lay your head down to sleep and wake up in the morning with the peace. Go through the day with the peace. Come back home with the peace. That's the godly peace. So you won't lose focus on what he's in the structure he's given you through the word of God. That's the peace of God. When you can still hear his voice. You can still hear him talk. You can still hear him say, wait a minute. Hold your peace. No, don't go there. Stay home. Speak. Listen. Let be a leaning post for somebody. Let them talk. Don't always give an answer. Go and pray with them. Or go stand in the corner and let them talk. You begin to hear the word of God. When you have the peace of God, the godly kind of peace, you begin to do all these things. You have clear understanding of God is saying to you to say to others. Philippians 4 and 7 says, according to the Bible, the peace of God which transcends all understanding. No confusion. Complete. That's the chaos. Confusion and disorder. But the peace is which transcends all understanding, a clarity. It is the harmony and calmness of the body, mind, spirit, trusting in the power and the grace of God. Can, can I stop there for a moment? Most of the time as, as, as believers, I need y'all to hear me here, most of the time as believers, where we fail or where we trip up at, we keep trying to bring God down to our level. The way we think, the way we handle things, and say, God, no, I think this is how it should be. I think I need to say something to make this better. And God tell you to be quiet, and you still want to keep going on. When we defy the word of God, those are the consequences we have to pay when we disobey the word of God. When we don't follow God's instructions. And we thinking that God don't love us, He don't want nothing to do with us, but it has everything to do with He gave us everything we need. He supplied us with all, our, all the needs that we have. He supplied everything for us. And we choose to step outside of his grace. We still, we, we, we fail to realize the power that he possessed. We, we fail to realize God is holy. He's holy. Everything about him is holy. He ain't no, he ain't no buddy of yours. He's your God. He's the sovereign one. The God of wrath. The God of love. The God of discipline. The one who cares. That's the God we serve. Calmness, harmony of the body, your mind, and your spirit. The power and the grace of God. Grace you don't even deserve. Paul is the author of this book. And who is Paul addressing in this book? Uh, now Paul addresses directly to the believers in the community. Philippi and encourage them to stand firmly in the Lord in this way. Um, and particularly he addressed two women. The letter of Paul in the Philippian, in the, this book of Philippians, is the eleventh book of the New Testament, uh, written by Apostle Paul the Apostle to the Christian congregation who had established, he had established in Philippi. It was pending while he was in prison. He, this was taking place while he was in prison, his writing, uh, in Rome or even in Ephesus, about 16 CE. Um, what was the main message? Paul was expressing his mindset of joy and that the Philippian believers cared about him and had sent him financial support while he was in prison. Paul was addressing him and thanking him. He always started out with peace and love and, 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 and the grace of God. He always started out his letters with that, giving thanks unto God, the Father and the Son, and also those who would assist him or supported him in the ministry. Paul was giving thanks why he was locked up, why he was going through pain and pressure, and maybe going with lack of poverty and everything. He was still giving thanks unto God. I, if I can part right there for a minute, that's what we have to do. We have to pattern out what Paul did. Remember, Paul was Saul at one time. Paul used to kill Christians. And then he discovered Christ on the road to Damascus to carry out assignment against the people of God. God met him on the road and changed his life. Where did God meet you at? Where did your life change at? 
And when Paul got the call, when his name was changed from Saul to Paul, he was on a mission. And Paul was told by God, you're going to suffer many things for my sake. And he still had peace. How do you have peace knowing that you're going to be attacked? Knowing that you're going to be hunted? Knowing that you're going to be people want you dead? Because of what you believe in. Not because of what you did. But because you believe in him. Sometimes we want to sit there and we want to complain about how bad our life is. But how about if you got challenged about your belief system? Do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus? Or denounce him or you're dead? No, no, I don't pray that it happen to you. But these are some of the things that they had to live through. Their lives have been taken for calling on the name of Jesus, for mentioning the name of Jesus. Who all the unbelievers said was dead. All the scribes and Pharisees say he died on the cross. But we know the peace that we had, knowing that he had been resurrected from the dead. The death, death couldn't hold him. The grave couldn't hold him. The devil couldn't bind him. That's the peace of God. And that's what you have attached yourself to the peace of God. And the word of God and everything that comes with it, the devil cannot hold you. No matter what situation you're going through, no matter where the devil tried to take you in your mind, you can always call on the name of the Lord. And he'll cover you. He'll cover you with his blood. Because when he shed, on the, shed his blood on Calvary's cross, that blood was not from all. It still has power. The power to cover you from all these sins. Wash you clean. But before I prayed, before we got started, I should have prayed. I always try to do this. Lord, forgive me for anything I might have said, done, or thought that wasn't pleasing in your sight. Every now and then, you make sure you include that in your prayer. Lord, if I miss up, Lord, I'm sorry. Because you've been good to me. You've been better than me than I've been to myself. And Lord, you deserve my best praise. And Lord, if I did anything that wasn't right, Lord, forgive me now. Because I have learned through my pain and pressure of life. I don't want to make God angry. I don't want to disappoint him. Even though I still mess up. Even though I still trip up. But soon as I get the opportunity, I have to quickly remind myself, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I done thought some things that wasn't holding. Lord, I'm sorry. Because I need that peace of God. The peace of God has to be rehearsed over and over again. You got to practice that. You got to want it. Then when you get it, you hold on to it. And the only thing you can hold on to the, the peace of God he gave me, his word. His word would not return unto the void. His word was Jesus Christ. In St. John chapter 1, it said, The word became flesh and dwelt, verse 14, became flesh and dwelt among us. The word, the truth, the word is what's going to keep you in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on him, stayed on the word of God. That's how we get our peace. That's how we relax and we lay back in our peace. We have to walk in it. We got to fight for it. We got to search for it. Amen. What was the problem in Philippians or Philippi? Verse 3, it says, uh, I was shaped by the particular uh, sociology and historical situation in Philippi, the church, namely ongoing conflict between the churches of Roman and social. Uh, Society in Philippi, at Philippi. This was a conflict caused, at the least in parts, by a clashing between the Christian gospel and the ideology of the civil culture of the city. The culture of the city was wrestling against the believers, the, the Christians in that area. There was, there was a clash. And that looks like the world that we're living in right now, where the truth is no longer the truth. The lie is now the truth. You can do anything. Things that you normally would get held responsible for were doing wrong in a court of law now seem to be you can do whatever you want. You can talk back to the judge. Some people, not everybody, so I'm glad they're trying that. But these are the things that the world has seen and start to disrespect the rules and the regulations that have been set. The world's going crazy. This is the world we're living in, and we need some peace. So how do we find this peace? in the middle of all this chaos. Like I said, all that's going on in the world, we still wrestle with our own issues. Do I have enough money in my pocket to keep food on the table for my children? When I go to the supermarket, the prices are rising. This ain't no political stuff. These are some of the challenges that people have. And then the enemy is after your mind. 
where we panic and have anxiety over everything that comes across our table because we have been spiritually damaged from the pain of the world. And you mean to tell me, Pastor Matt, you can still find peace in the middle of pain? Yes, you can. And we're going to direct you towards that tonight. If the devil can't still, if he can steal your peace, he would change your behavior. Your behavior would change if the devil can steal your peace. He knows what he's after. He has a plan. He has a strategy. He's been watching you. He knows what it takes to trip you up. He knows if you're a fearful person, he's going to bring some things that put you in fear, cause you to tremble, cause you to be afraid, cause you to lose focus, cause you to forget who's in the boat with you. In this text here, Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 to 27, it says, Jesus calmed the storm, verse 23. Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a ferocious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. Peace. He knew who he was. If I can stop there for a moment. If you really know who Christ was, I, I, I never, I, I tell this story a lot because it really brings me back to how good God has been to me. I remember when I was hurt years ago with my back. I was off work for three months and then I went back to work and my back was hurting again. And, and you know how it is for 12 weeks and try to lay you off or whatever you take over your time. You know how that works. My back is still in bad shape. I remember in three months. Now, at this time, this was, this was back in the early 2000s. Now, maybe your bank account was good, but mine wasn't. I was, I was living there on the edge. Yeah, paycheck to paycheck. And then I thank God he blessed me through my giving, my tithing, that I don't have to live paycheck to paycheck. He done took me to another level based on my faithfulness to him for being so good to me. So that, that's, that's a message for another day. But I remember at this time, I was still young in the faith, and I was off work, I was in pain. All work and in pain, poverty and in pain. Feeling less than a man, feel like I can't take my family, can't take care of my family. And I remember sitting, moping, and whining like we all do. Knowing God, that I'm, I'm sitting with a roof over my head. There is food in the kitchen. May not be what I don't, what I want to eat, but there was still food in the kitchen. The heat was still on, and I remember sitting there moping and complaining about how bad my life was. And I remember my wife and the kids went out, they got the bikes and they were riding the bikes. I'm standing there looking out the window, looking at my family. Back hurt, I can't go out there and enjoy it with them. Complaining. And I remember listening to a, a TV evangelist, and he was preaching um, how to praise God in the middle of your storm. I'm saved. I'm a believer. But in my mind, I say, yeah, all right. Because sometimes that pressure and pain can be so heavy in your mind. The enemy can have you so jacked up where it really ain't that bad compared to other people's storms. But it looked so bad in my eyes. I say, yeah, right. And then all of a sudden, I said, well, let me try. Let me praise God in the middle of my storm. So half-heartedly, I'm walking around the house with my hands up. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, praise your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And I messed around and said the name of Jesus one too many times. Because I had a relationship with him and knew it at one time when I was studying my word and trusting in God and wasn't living in fear, I knew there was power in that name. I'm talking to somebody here. I knew there was power in that name. And I kept calling that name and messed around and said it one too many times. And then my hands went up a little bit higher, praising the name of Jesus. And as my hands slipped up in the air, I began to speak in tongues. And thank God, I got caught up in praise and worship. And all of a sudden, he showed up. What I mean, he showed up. Some people might say, oh, I don't believe that. That's what I felt the presence of God all over me. And it brought fear and joy at the same time. I, I, I can't explain it. All I can tell you, I know it wasn't the devil because I done been, I done felt the presence of the, the evil one in my vicinity. It was the presence of God because the reverence was so strong that I fell to my knees. And I would repent and say, Lord, forgive me for not trusting in you. Forgive me for giving up too soon. 
Lord, you brought me through it one time. You'll bring me through it again. I'm talking to somebody here. This is where we live at sometimes. We whine too much. We didn't learn how to wait. I didn't know how to wait on God. But through my pressure and pain, I had to learn how to trust in Him and wait on Him and wait for Him to show up, wait for Him to deliver me. But I was already delivered. I just had to come under the understanding that God got me. And I remember falling to the ground as if I was dead. And I could feel him pick me up off the ground. And this is what kept me connected with God. This is what kept me going on. Because I had an encounter with God. I, I, I felt his presence. I mean, it was so strong on me. Like I said, I was trembling and, and I was afraid and joyful at the same time. I really can't explain it. Words can't explain how my body was reacting. In the presence of the Lord. And I felt him pick me up. He said I was a God that was dead and yet lived. I am the God that divided the Red Sea. He was telling me who he was. I'm talking to somebody here. Through the word of God. Through the preaching of the word of God. Through the word of God that I read. He reminded me. He said I am the one that said was dead. But yet I live. I am the one that opened up the blind eyes. Cause the lame to walk. He began to tell me who he was. And as he began to tell me who he was, I heard the still voice as he was beginning, seemed like his presence was departing from me. And I didn't want him to leave. It felt that good. As I felt him easing away from me, he said, if you really knew who I was, hear me. I'm talking to you, believer. I'm talking to you, unbeliever. He said, if you really knew who I was, you wouldn't worry about nothing. Every now and then I got to remind myself of that story. And I want to remind you, if we really get a chance to know who he is, we don't have to worry about anything. Why? Because he's God. Almighty, all-powerful, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, Prince of Peace. A high tower, a leading post. He's our all in all. He's our everything. And he will bless us according to how we trust in him and keep his word. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Keep my statutes, my commandments. You'll be blessed in the field, blessed in the city, blessed going in and blessed going out. That's the blessing. That's the peace of God. That even in the middle of the storm, while you're out there in all this mayhem and hell that's going on in the world, you can still have peace. While everybody's crying, said, look what's going on. We can say, but you know what? God is still in control. I might not understand what he's doing, but I believe that he got everything under control. And all I got to do is keep telling people about his goodness and tell them about the peace of God in the middle of your pain. And if we begin as believers to unify, come together in solidarity and lift up the name of Jesus, I believe, I believe the situation will turn around. We can say the end time all we want. I've been hearing it. I'm saying it. But God only knows. My plea to you is to be ready when he comes. Be on your post. And back to the story. I mean to jump off. I'm sorry for getting off line. I got to get back to the word of God. Here it is. Uh, Matthew 28, 23. Jesus was in the boat. He was asleep. He was at peace. But the disciples, when it woke him up, Saying, Lord, save us. <laughs> We're going to drown. Remember the anxiety? Remember the pain and the pressure? So heavy on you, you forget who's in the boat with you. But they went and woke him up. And they said, Lord, don't you care? Save us. We don't want to die. And this is what Jesus said unto them. He replied, You, ye of your little faith, why are you so afraid? Why are you so scared? You've seen the things I've done. You've read about the things I've done. You've seen what I've done in your life. You've seen what I've done for your family. And I, I want to stop here for a minute because I know, I know somebody who's probably hurt right now who might have lost a loved one. I, I, I don't take it lightly of your pain of losing somebody that you care about. Whether it was from a sickness, whether it was tragic, my heart goes out to you. But even in your loss, the God that I stir can still bring peace. I'm a witness. I, I, I lost a mother. I lost a father. I lost a brother. I lost my friend a couple
my best friends that I grew up with, ones I used to hang out with. Some came into church and some didn't. Seeing lives lost that were so close to me. And the question that come to my mind, Lord, am I next? But even if I am next, because I have the peace of God, I have the safety and the safeguard that I need. So if he do come back for me, I'm going home to be with him. That's the privilege, that's the blessing of having the peace of God. Knowing who he is. Knowing that I trust his word. In this text, he said, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and he demonstrated what somebody can do that has peace. When you got peace, when your family, everybody's going crazy, the kids are acting crazy, not speaking to you, don't want to come home or being disrespectful, you can do what Jesus did. Not fearful, not afraid. Look at the situation. He spoke to the wind. The Bible says he rebuked the wind and the waves, and it was completely calm that he spoke. The thing is, when we stand up and we rebuke something in the name of Jesus, when we call something out that's going wrong in our life, and we don't see the evidence of it changing, what we do, we get fearful. We say, oh, our prayers didn't work. But I declare to you, if you stand and trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to the way you think, the way you think is, I didn't see it, it must not be true. But when you believe by faith, you believe that even though I don't see it, God got this situation under control. I wish I could hear somebody clap right now in their house, right now over that. You know by faith that God has turned that situation around. And you got to stand firm and trust in him every step of the way. He rebuked the wind and the waves. And it was completely calm. The men were so amazed and they asked him, they asked themselves, what kind of man is this? That even the wind and the waves obey him. I don't know about y'all, but if I'm in a, a battle or in a fight or in a war, I want somebody like this in my corner. And I want to tell you believers, I want to tell you saints of God, you have somebody in your corner that no matter what waves or storm come your way. You got a winner in your corner. Not only is he in your corner, the Holy Spirit, which is the comforter, now lives on the inside of you. And the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of you can get, come up against any challenge. I don't care if you're married or unmarried, you're going through some, I don't care if you're going through domestic violence and say, don't look like I can get out of this thing. Call on the name of the Lord and watch what he do for you. But when you call on him and you hear him speak, do what he said. Do what he said. Look at your neighbor and say, do what he said. Look at somebody else and say, do what he said. Tell the cat and dog, just do what he said. How can I become consistent with my peace? Uh, my, wife, my microwave answer to this, the question is, how can I become more consistent with my peace? My microwave answer is, just trust God and do what he says. It is very challenging for, for us to stay consistent, even with God. It is. I, I, I'm not going to say it's easy, because we, we're so used to us. We're so used to giving up. We're so used to seeing people give up. So sometimes when we can say it, but it's hard to do it. Because there's some times in my life where I'm up one minute. And I don't read the Bible, but I've seen some of the same characters in the Bible done the same thing. Pray one minute. Elijah, pray the fire come down. And then as soon as Jezebel threatened, he'd be running high. So we've got so many different uh, scenarios and examples in the Bible that sounds just like us. We're no different from them. One minute we are, everything going well. We got money in our pocket. Everybody eat. We, we holler and we pray with you about thanks. But can you praise him when you just got that bad report and you're feeling bad on? These are some of the things that a true believer, hear me now, a true believer can help set, set the captive free. Your testimony can really make a difference if you're going through it. You still tell people. I remember the last days of my father. He died on December the eighth, and, and it's a it's a bittersweet moment, you know. You know when that day comes, we 
remember Dad. That's that's pops. That's pops. Man, he was taking shirt off his back. Not literally. He would do that. He was that type of dude. Man of God. He preached the word, but he also was the humblest man you could ever meet. Those who know my father, Robbie Will see Mac, they know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm so proud that he called his son because that was a man I seen live it. Not just preach it, he lived it. Now I know he might have had his own inner struggles and stuff he might have been dealing with, but that, that was between him and God. But on his last and final days, I remember going to the nursing home and seeing him. And I was in there, you know, talking to him and cleaning his hands, I always shaving him and everything. And I remember feeling like this is the last day. I felt it. And my brother, Dora, was having a birthday party at the I was going there later. And as I was going there, I left, I looked back into the room, and I seen him and just felt like this was it. So when I went to the party, my brother's uh, kid's birthday party, Lamar, I told him, I said, if y'all want to see Dad, you better go see him now. And make a long story short, that was the day my dad left. But the blessing was, I'm talking about pain that leads to peace. The, the, the blessing of it when we found out he had went on. The orderly, the guy that was coming through the room and the nurse that was tending to him, they walked by and they looked at him and he was taking his last breath. And you know what my father was doing? He wasn't crying. He wasn't in there saying, Lord, forgive me. He had his hands up, giving God praise. He was giving God praise after laying on his sick bed for 14 months with a stroke, paralyzed on one side, unable to speak, lift up his hand, body weak, bones all frill, skinny, just wasting away, was able to lift up his hands in the middle of his pain with peace. And said, Lord, come get me. They said, like, he was calling the Lord and said, come on, I'm ready. So, I don't stand before you just for you to say, oh, 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 that, that, oh, that was a great testimony. I'm telling you some things I have seen and witnessed. And so have you. Don't ignore what God has shown you. Don't ignore the life you have been given. God has chosen for you. It might not have been perfect, but you have seen the hand of God move. And I've seen it time and time again. And they've been challenging at times. But because I have a relationship with him, and the Holy Spirit lives on the inner side of me, that one of the benefits of being connected to God is he lives on the inside of me. That I have somebody to speak to me and, and show me the right way. I just have to stay connected to his word enough so I can obey it. That's how we lose our peace. When we don't, we don't take advantage of the, the, the gift that God has given us, the Holy Spirit. And we ignore the instructions of the Holy Spirit. And we choose to do it our way. Cause conflict. Cause delay. God don't throw us away. But it's the law of rest of life. You, what you weep, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. We have to keep these things in mind. They're not going to go away. God don't change. He's not like us. We are impatient, we're heartless at times, we're fearful, we're selfish, inconsistent of others, greedy, prideful, and lazy. God is not a microwave, but he can get anything done quick, fast, and in a hurry, according to his perfect will. I need you to hear that. He's not a microwave. We, what it is, we can't explain or interpret anything through our delivery to define such a holy God. So we use certain things like microwaves to remind us of some of the attributes of God's love and how quick he can do things. Yes, God can answer that prayer. Yes, he can turn your situation around right away. But according to his perfect will, we don't know what God's perfect will was for you. He might need you to linger that a while so you can get a full understanding how to trust in him and not trust in yourself. Get you out of trouble too soon, you get right back into trouble. Have you ever been there? I know I have. I had to water on some things for a while because God knew his perfect will at the end that I will eventually surrender. But the blessing of it, he didn't throw me away. But if I had to do it over again, I wouldn't take that chance because somebody didn't make, somebody didn't get the chance you and I got. 
And since we got the chance, we need to try to rescue others through the life that we live trusting and depending on God's word. So we can illustrate, demonstrate the peace of God that we have so others can desire. And I'm going to close right here. We're going to pick back up. We're going to pick back up next week. But I want to close right here. I'll start closing. Uh, but he can do things. He can do it quick, fast, and hurt, like I said. But it got to be according to his perfect will. And God knows what his perfect will is. We just got to trust. Malachi 3 and 6. For I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, you son of Jacob are not to sin. People change, but God doesn't. Remember we talked about being consistent? Consistent in that peace? Consistency. Doing what pleases God every time, each time, and for a long time. You have to chuck, you too, you have charged us to keep your commandments carefully. Oh, that my actions will consistently reflect your decree. Your decree is what you have instructed us to do. Then I will not be ashamed to compare my life with your commands. This is Psalms 111, 4 and 6. It has been said that the only uh, constant is change. The only thing constant is change. Uh, that everything flows and nothing stays the same or stands the same. We look around us and that seems to be true. Seasons change, people age, uh, civilization rises and falls. Is there any time truly consistent? Is there any form of truth we can hold on to in the world that is always not shifting? No, we can't hold on to the truth because it's always shifting in the world. But one thing you can bet your dollar on that yes, God himself tells us that he does not change. If God said it, it's going to come to pass. We don't worry about him changing his mind or changing what he said. He's not going to change. He don't do like we do. What is the peace of God? And how can I experience it? Most of all, let us begin with the word grace and peace. To you, from God, our Father, and Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. Peace is a state of tranquility, peace, and quietness of the spirit that transcends circumstances. It would change the circumstance if we learn how to live in peace and keep our mind surrounded by God's love and trust in Him, knowing that if God be for me, He's more than the whole world against me. Finding peace in the midst of a chaotic situation, a chaotic world, in the midst of chaos. That's where we find ourselves. God shows us time and time again, and next week, we're going to pick back up on this. Well, I'm going to show you scripture after scripture. God's explaining and showing us the peace of God. The peace that passes all understanding. The peace that he gives, not as the world gives, but the peace that he gives to us. So we can rest and we can be that light shining in the, in the midst of dark. Be that beacon of light on a hill, not hidden with a basket, but that the world and the unbelievers can see the goodness of of the Lord through you. I want to thank you for spending time with me tonight. Finding your peace. Finding your peace. Not nobody else. You got to find your peace. And a godly peace is what you're searching for. I thank you once again. Until we meet again, I'm Pastor Gary Mack. God bless you and have a wonderful night.